Hey, um, I'm going to apologize in advance. In order to keep this in the 15 to 20 minutes that everybody would like it to stay in, I have to read it. So I apologize for putting you to sleep now. Um, but I'll just start taking off. If we define the term revolution as an event that signifies fundamental change in a governing system, there were, of course, two revolutions in 1917. One that moved Imperial Russia from an absolutist monarchic system to a system run by the elites of the Russian legislature, a weak parliamentary system, and one that moved Russia from a weak parliamentary system to that of its proponents hoped, socialism. Both groups faced, however, significant problems in 1917. A poorly run war that bred corruption and inflation, a small and heavily oppressed working class, nationalities and minorities that eagerly wished to escape the tyrannical rule of the Russian Orthodox majority, a nation of peasants that produced and consumed little, and an entrenched bureaucracy that resisted any fundamental change. Unfortunately, we can't really go into great depth on each topic in the lecture. However, afterwards, the discussion, if you have any questions, of course, I'm more than happy to answer them. When the Bolsheviks seized power in November 1917, their October, so that's why you see sometimes it called the October Revolution, sometimes the November Revolution, they had not been neutral on these issues. The Bolsheviks had fully supported Order No. 1, issued in March, that said elected committees should run military units and that officers should not command except during tactical operations. Order No. 1 came not through the provisional government that uh, was made up of Duma elites, but it came from the Petrograd Soviet of um, People's Deputies, Petrograd Soviet of People's Deputies of Workers and Soldiers, later peasants were added, um, which was the shadow government run by Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, SRE, and other revolutionaries. Uh, many soldiers, of course, accepted Order Number no. One because either they did not want to listen to incompetent commanders, of which there were many, who threw them into useless battles, or workers in the army were more willing to listen to Mensheviks and Bolsheviks than to a military run by princes and large businessmen, particularly when those princes and large businessmen were encouraging the inflation that was bankrupting their families. By late July 1917, the Bolsheviks had wrested control of the Petrograd Soviet from the Mensheviks and right SA, and in November they eradicated rank, further encouraging soldiers and sailors to resist orders coming from monarchic and bourgeois sources. The soldiers were happy to comply. Many of them simply wanted to go home. Unfortunately, the chaos spread by the military having two masters, that is, the old system as well as the new system. In any revolution, you do not have a clear divide, of course. Um, this did not translate into better living conditions for soldiers or civilians immediately. The Russian army found itself continually in retreat as poorly trained peasants and workers replaced poorly trained Tsarist officers, if the peasants and workers remained in the army at all. The Russian navy was all but sunk. The German navy was far superior to the Russian navy. Even the Turkish navy had success against the Russian navy, and that's very sad. By July 1917, 7 million men had deserted the military, though many of the men deserted multiple times. So of that 7 million, uh, that's not single men, uh, but uh, in many cases, multiple desertions. The strain put upon those who remained was immense. Casualties piled up, soldiers fragged officers, whether Bolshevik, Menshevik, or Tsarist, and many Russians turned on their own populations. It was not uncommon for the Russian army, as it retreated, to rape and pillage the villages with which it came in contact, so much so that minorities often claimed that the Germans were better at treating them civilly than the Russian army was. That's not good. Uh, the, while the parliamentarians promised democracy and the Bolsheviks promised peace, land, and bread, many soldiers and sailors found the Bolsheviks more convincing. Their slogan promised more immediate and concrete benefits. In November, when Lenin declared peace with all nations, many soldiers became convinced that the war would end soon and even more returned home, much to the Germans' happiness, who continued, of course, to move eastward. The military's demand for food, materiel, and other supplies, however, continued to stress Russia's weak industrial system. Industrial workers represented about 2% of Russia's 165 million people. Hours were long, pay was low, an 80-hour work week with pay for only 40 or 60 hours was not unusual. War-related inflation had raised the price of food, fuel, and even living space, resulting in a near-starvation existence for most workers and their families. Even though the provisional government had legislated eight-hour workdays and a raise in the minimum wage, 
Most large industrialists ignored the government and continued to exploit their workers. While the majority of workers did not support the Mensheviks or the Bolsheviks, they didn't support anyone in particular. They were willing to support anyone who offered them better living conditions. By November, Lenin had declared a peace, though war continued, nationalized all lands belonging to the Russian Orthodox Church, the Crown, and the nobility, and instituted workers' control in factories, fulfilling demands of many of the workers who were one generation removed from the peasantry, heavily crushed by the burdens of an industrialized war, and starving. Workers were willing to accept the Bolsheviks, provided promises were fulfilled. We usually think of the working classes of, the Petrograd, of Petrograd and Moscow because of a great Russian bias. However, strikes and demonstrations were not uncommon in Warsaw, Kiev, Vilnius, Baku, and Minsk. Farther east, there were smaller strikes and demonstrations because of smaller industrialized popula populations, but they did exist. Um, typically against, of course, the bad working hours, the bad working conditions, and everything else negative they were experiencing in context of the war. However, minorities in general tended to be a bit more resistant to the Bolsheviks because they were dealing with more immediate problems, such as German occupation, or they resented the great Russian and sometimes Jewish names of Bolshevik leadership. If peace only meant the cessation of war, the Germans brought it. The Germans also allowed new distribution of communal land or supported private ownership in areas that they occupied. And with the cessation of war, planting and harvesting, harvesting ensured bread. So the Bolsheviks certainly had their work cut out for them in minority areas. While Lenin signed a decree on the rights of self-determination for all peoples, there was the belief that he didn't mean it because of the war situation. Sitting in Smolny in November of 1917, there was really little the Bolsheviks could do about that belief. Uh, allowing self-determination simply recognized the current situation, and many of the members of what became Sovnarkom hoped might sway nationalities towards the Bolsheviks because German occupation was still German occupation rather than indigenous rule. Germany held Poland, Lithuania, parts of Ukraine, and much of Belarusia. After the failed armistice in December, the Germans pressed eastward, taking the rest of Belarusia and Ukraine, defeating its Bolshevik, Russian Bolshevik government, and added Latvia and Estonia. Turkey took Armenia. Finland, Azerbaijan, and Georgia seceded. These minorities, however, had never been happy under the Tsars and had been eager to escape the great Russians, regardless of their political outlooks. And we're familiar with this because many of those uh, new nations also had Bolshevik uh, leaders of their own that attempted either to take control or became parts of governments in one way or another. By the mid-1920s, many of these groups returned to the great Russian minor ma ma sorry, majority, but that's outside the scope of this lecture at this time. Right away, the loss of these workers and peasants was a huge problem for the Bolsheviks. As the German zone moved eastward, Russia lost 33% of its factories, 26% of its railroads, 73% of its iron industry, and 75% of its coal fields. It lost 60 million people, and out of 165 million, that's almost 40%. For a political party that depended upon a proletariat, that was a problem. This tied back to the worker issue. If there are no inputs or markets for industrial workers, they cannot work. That's kind of obvious. <laughs> As the Bolsheviks found, when workers cannot work, they cannot earn pay. If they have no pay, they can't afford food, fuel, and rent. And then they get angry. Even workers' control could not fix the goods famine. Instead, factories paid workers for not working, but then many ran out of payroll. Lenin and Sofnarkom responded by eliminating money. Unfortunately, factories were unprepared to exchange with each other and supply other workers with goods because they did not have the goods. Russian workers and peasants were already relying on barter. The elimination of money did not eliminate their problems finding food and fuel. And so many workers actually fled back to the mirrors, the small communes, uh, farming communes from which they came. Peasants had always been an imperial problem and thus became a problem for the Bolsheviks. The peasantry was 80% of the population. It was barely above subsistence level, so it produced little. Its poverty provided a limited market, though its size helped assuage that for industrial workers. <coughs> 